We think in metaphors. This thesis was put forward by two linguists, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, in the book Metaphors We Live By, published in 1980. The publication turned the entire paradigm of linguistic research upside down, and even to say it, we use the metaphor, turn something upside down. Lakoff and Johnson's observation was not unprecedented. Already the 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche called language very metaphorically an army of metaphors, but it was the first such explicit expression of an idea. Namely, not only do we use metaphors when we communicate with each other as a stylistic device, but we also think in metaphors. That is, our mental processes are based on a metaphorical grasp of reality. Time is money treats the concept of time as a valuable object, defeating the opponent's argument assumes that the discussion is a fight. Get depressed or uplift shows how we metaphorically value the directions up and down and solve the problem indicates that the problem is some kind of a puzzle. Regardless of whether we agree with Lakoff and Johnson that all our thinking is based on metaphors, we can clearly see that metaphors are an inseparable element of organizing knowledge about the world. And if so, it's worth checking which metaphors are clear. Clear and bring us closer to the nature of things and phenomena and which, on the contrary, mislead us. Adam Smith and an Invisible Hand How does this relate to the economy? As it turns out, this field of knowledge is full of metaphors, comparisons, analogies, and attempts to visualize complex processes also that we can more easily grasp economic phenomena and learn to operate on them. One of the most frequently invoked but also distorted and misunderstood metaphors in the history of economic thought is the term invisible hand. It deserves more attention. An invisible hand is a metaphor first used by Adam Smith, an 18th century Scottish economist and philosopher, in the theory of moral sentiments published in 1759. The produce of the soil maintains at all times nearly that number of inhabitants which it's capable of maintaining. The rich only select from the heap what is most precious and agreeable. They consume little more than the poor, and in spite of their natural selfishness and rapacity, though the sole end which they propose from the labors of all the thousands whom they employ be the gratification of their own vain and insatiable desires, they divide with the poor the produce of all their improvements. They are led by an invisible hand to make nearly the same distribution of the necessaries of life, which would have been made had the earth been divided into equal portions among all its inhabitants and thus, without intending it, without knowing it, advance the interest of the society and afford means to the multiplication of the species. An invisible hand is a description of how and why everyone can take advantage of certain resources, even though the land that spawned them is nominally owned by one person. On the face of it, such an owner could consume what belongs to him, but Smith explains why this is neither possible nor desirable from the owner's point of view. An invisible hand appears also in the Scottish economist's much widely known Opus Magnum, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, published in 1776, as every individual therefore endeavors as much as he can both to employ his capital in the support of domestic industry and so to direct that industry that its produce may be of the greatest value. Every individual necessarily labors to render the annual revenue of the society as great as he can. He generally indeed neither intends to promote the public interest, nor knows how much he is promoting it. By preferring the support of domestic to that of foreign industry, he intends only his own security, and by directing that industry in such a manner as its produce may be of the greatest value, he intends only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention nor is it always the worse for the society that it was no part of it. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. In this passage from chapter 2 of book 4 of The Wealth of Nations, the metaphor of an invisible hand is a visualization of an apparent paradox. Adam Smith tries to explain here how it happens that a man guided by an individual private and egoistic self-interest, regardless of the broadly understood social good, contributes to the multiplication of not only his own well-being, but also the well-being of society. The whole paragraph is about the lack of contradiction between pursuing one's own economic goals and multiplying the wealth of the nation, and even more about the fact that sometimes taking care of one's own interest serves the whole society better than being a self-sacrificing servant in the public service. So much for an invisible hand in the works of Adam Smith. 
Not much if we compare it with the vastness of all the works of the Scottish author and with the multitude of subsequent interpretations, reinterpretations, and criticisms to which this idea has been subjected. It's worth noting here that in Smith, an invisible hand was always an indefinite hand, not a specific hand of a concrete, even if abstract, person. In the writings of The Economist, the term an invisible hand appears, not the invisible hand, which makes a significant difference, as we will see shortly. Metaphors do careers as well. The concept of the invisible hand made a dizzying career regardless of its creator's intentions and long after his death. Adam Smith wrote simply about an invisible hand. Only the 19th century German politician and socialist activist Ferdinand LaSalle coined the phrase the invisible hand of the market. However, the metaphor became a real phenomenon only in the 20th century, in particular thanks to the economist Paul Samuelson, or by him, if one considers the evolution of this term to be a distortion of the original concept. Samuelson made the invisible hand of the market almost synonymous with the concept of perfect competition in economics, co-authored with William Nordhaus and published in 1948. Since the work has become a widely used economics textbook, translated into various languages, reprinted many times, and used in universities around the world, it is Samuelson's, not Smith's idea of the invisible hand that most people, including economists, associate the term with today. We'll talk about the assumptions and problems with the concept of perfect competition, or Samuelson's synonym for the invisible hand, in one of the next episodes. Criticism of content or form Everything we've talked about so far adds up to a dangerous mixture that makes the invisible hand a particularly double-edged concept. It's often difficult to tell whether a critic or, less often, enthusiast of the term is attacking or praising the alleged flaws or virtues of Adam Smith's idea of the invisible hand or Ferdinand LaSalle's parody or Samuelson's. Very often, criticism of the supposedly naive concept of the invisible hand is identified with a comprehensive criticism of the foundations of the free market and capitalism, private property rights, and the principles of free movement of goods and services. American economist Joseph Stiglitz, winner of the 2001 Nobel Prize in Economics and researcher of the so-called market failure, uses the concept of the invisible hand to knock out the free market opponents, nomen omen, hand, and show that their supposed guru, Adam Smith, would not be on their side at all today. And he shows this with the example of the issue of externalities. Adam Smith, the father of modern economics, is often invoked as an argument for the invisible hand and free markets. Companies, in search of profit, do what is best for the world with an invisible hand. But unlike his supporters, Adam Smith was aware of some of the limitations of free markets, and since then, Scientific research has explained why free markets by themselves often do not lead to the best. As I put it in my new book, Making Globalization Work, the reason the invisible hand often seems invisible is that it's often not there. Whenever there are externalities, where a person's actions affect others for which they are not paying or compensated, the markets will not work well. Theses about the failure of markets in relation to externalities do not remain unanswered by defenders of market solutions. From Ronald Coase's article, The Problem of Social Cost from 1960, to the works of contemporary economists. It's a complex issue, but that's not what we're talking about in today's episode. What we would like to point out is how the concept of the invisible hand is used in the critique of free market solutions. What's wrong with the invisible hand? Regardless of its original use in the works of Adam Smith, from later evolutions of meaning or intentional misuses, the metaphor of the invisible hand is an attempt to capture market processes rests on uncertain foundations. Why? If we remember that, as the linguists Lakoff and Johnson argued, a large part of thought processes is based on metaphors, we'll see the dangers of the term invisible hand. Firstly, the metaphor brings to mind one single hand that decides where on the map of the economic world to place given means of production. In religious terms, this may come close to the idea of providence, but it's not understood in this way today. In a secularized world, the invisible hand is associated with the unnoticed but ubiquitous influence of some powerful force. What force? Critics of free market capitalism come running with the answer, of course, this hand belongs to big business. Powerful companies, large corporations, multinationals, market monopolists, imposing their conditions on everyone else. This hand, say the opponents of the free market, in reality, is the suffocating grip on the throat of society. Or it's not an invisible hand at all, but only an iron fist, as Kevin Carson tries to argue. Regardless of whether such criticism is justified or not, 
it's impossible not to notice that the metaphor of the hand is begging to be used by anti-capitalists and statists. Secondly, why one hand? Why not hands? The history of economics is the history of trying to explain how hundreds, thousands, millions, even billions of people can collaborate, produce, trade, exchange the fruits of their efforts, and share labor without a single central decision maker to place them all like pawns on a chessboard. Leonard Reed's story, I Pencil, shows how, and how and why, countless individuals who don't even know each other create a system of global interaction, a free market between individuals and countries that leads to the creation of ever greater wealth. How can the metaphor of a single hand fit into such an image, even if it's invisible? It can't. So it might be worth thinking about alternatives to Smith's old concept. Finally, thirdly, simply calling this hand of the market invisible can also lead to confusion. Adam Smith tried to illustrate the simple truth that there is no visible planner who would tell the baker to bake bread and the shoemaker to make shoes, and then exchange the goods produced because all this happens invisibly, as an integral part of everyone's life, next to all other human activities. And yet, invisibility is associated with impersonality. After all, people are not invisible. The invisible hand, therefore, brings to mind something that goes on independently, without the participation and effort of people next to them something that just happens. The problem is that market processes don't work like that. It's not some magical, invisible force doing things for someone else, but the sum of the most visible efforts, productivity, ingenuity, and entrepreneurship of countless individuals. There's nothing invisible about it, other than the fact that in order to embrace the entire network of global economic connections, one must enter a certain level of abstract thinking. Everything else is very visible and human, resulting from creative thinking and hard work. There's hardly anything further from the invisible world than what's happening year after year, day after day, hour after hour in markets around the world. Summary As you can see, the metaphors we use matter. It's worth considering whether the language we use and the images we want to evoke with our words really accurately reflect what we want to convey. Because if not, we become easy prey for ideological opponents who can easily use poorly coined terms to discredit our ideas even when they're right. Are you familiar with Hayek's term, spontaneous order? Yes or no? 